takes a lifetime. And she's there. So the study two years of intense study. Or all oral exams that are very I was just going to guys very few people in the reach the eighth degree and they got severe. You know what I'm saying. So there we go. Everybody, how are we all doing tonight? Pretty good. That was kind of weak. How are we doing tonight? Awesome, guys. We are back with another awesome see and learn event. And oh boy, do we got a good one for you guys tonight. So uh, we're going to start with a quick video to introduce see and learn, and then we'll get into it. guys welcome back to another great see and learn event today and oh boy do we have a lot for you guys tonight i'm very excited for tonight i hope you guys are too and uh, of course like lynn was saying earlier um if you guys are viewing online you might not have heard it but there's a lot of things that uh, make see and learn happen we reach out to a lot of different people throughout the month but it takes a lot of support from pretty much everybody in order for this to happen every single year we've been running for 18 years now it's, that's not something that just happens out of the blue it's very intentional and it's very well built so we're going to thank some of the people that help to make this run every single year. The very first one is Carib Trans. They sponsor the live streaming that we do. So if you guys ever want to watch this again, maybe my lovely voice will put you to sleep at night or, you know, whatever. Uh, or if you have some friends that want to see all of the programs we have, then you can watch our videos on Facebook Live or on YouTube afterwards. So uh, definitely check out uh, our Facebook page, See and Learn, and thank you to Carib Trans. Now, our speaker tonight is sponsored by Cloudbreak Villa. All right, they're offering her accommodation for the week. So can we give a big round of applause to Cloudbreak? Awesome, and of course, none of this would be possible without two of our biggest sponsors, the Bit Prince Bernhard Culture Funds and Public Entity Save Us. So a big round of applause for those guys. They are huge sponsors for us, so it's uh, really important that um, we, you know, just give, a sh give them a shout out every time that we can. Now, it takes pretty much everybody's support to make this happen. So big round of applause to uh, all the people that are up here and to all the people that aren't up here. Save is a, a uh, island-wide event, so uh, it really takes a lot of people to make this happen. If you guys are interested in learning how you can support See and Learn, one way is those raffle tickets, like Lynn was saying, or you can talk to Lynn more and learn how you can maybe get your logo up here. If you have a company or just a picture of your face, you know, however you want to do it and uh, learn how you can really help us to keep this going throughout the rest of the years. Now, the raffle tickets. I know the people in person have heard a little bit about it tonight already. For you online viewers, I'll go through it real quick. We've got a lot of great prizes. So uh, several different cottages that are giving away three night stays. Those are over $300 a night for each of those. So that's crazy value. Um, we've got a guided hike from the Saba Conservation Foundation, a glass making class with Joe Bean herself. I believe she's back on island now. She was off for a little bit. Uh, we have an indigo throw that is amazing. We have some handcrafted jewelry 
right over there we've got some uh, homemade uh, beauty products and things like that that Lynn was talking about. We've got a signed copy of Edie Winter's brand new book, Below the Edge of Darkness. She was a speaker here earlier in the month, so if you guys didn't get to see her, head to our Facebook or our uh, YouTube and you can watch her presentation and then read her book. We have got a handcrafted knife by John. And we have got an eight. Yeah. Oh, he's even in the house. Oh, I didn't see him up there. He's at the bar. Oh. I know. I shouldn't have been surprised, huh? Um, and then we've got an eight day, seven night, fully paid for scuba diving live aboard on the Caribbean Explorer. So that is insane amount of value. Even if you only spend like $150, $200 on tickets, you are getting it back with almost all of these prizes. All right. So definitely check out those raffle tickets and uh, you can buy them even if you're not here. So online, just contact us. We will find a way to get you those raffle tickets. Now, some upcoming events. Tonight, uh, sorry, tomorrow night is the last day of See and Learn. We've had a great month out here. Oh, I know. It makes me sad. Uh, but we've still got a few things that are left. So um, at Fort Bay tomorrow, we are going on a cleanup dive. We're going to be going around the mooring field to try and pick up as much trash as we can. It's really important that we're taking care of our island out here. Um, and even if we're not the ones putting the trash in the ocean, we still can have some uh, effort to help clean it up. So definitely sign up for that. Emily has got the sign up sheets right now. So whenever uh, you guys want to sign up, especially afterwards, after you uh, hear Carolyn talk tonight, then we can get you on the boat tomorrow afternoon. And tomorrow night is the big night it is closing night we are having our final speaker andy everybody wave awesome so he's going to be giving his presentation tomorrow night and we are going to be having the raffle drawing so if you guys want to be here for the excitement i don't know if we have any gamblers out there but when you're in person it's much much better so definitely come out to long haul and uh Hang out with us for the night. It's going to be a big event, a lot of, a lot of fun out there. Um, so sign up at the See and Learn tent or just show up, and we will see you guys tomorrow night. Now, for tonight's speaker, I have a little question real quick. So who in the crowd has something, that they would, something on them that they would consider reused or recycled or repurposed? You know, What do you have, Larry? Oh, okay, besides what we just gave to literally everybody in the crowd right now. What about something else? Anybody? Oh, a dollar. Yeah, dollars get reused and reused. That is awesome. Anybody else? Most of the clothes that you're wearing? Yeah. Secondhand shopping or passed down. Adam? Yeah, so... He's saying his stands and his equipment are from different places around the island. So uh, we do try and reuse as much as we can. Now, recycle doesn't just have to mean plastic things that are made into new. or It can really be maybe a family heirloom that's passed down to you, a necklace or a ring. Or it can be clothing that's just you're borrowing from a friend. Anything that you have that's kind of got a new life or a new purpose because you're using it now, that's all repurposed and recycled. So uh, that is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, Carolyn Caparuso is actually a former See and Learn team member. So she was on the island for almost three years. Yeah, a big round of applause. We wouldn't be here today without her help, so that is awesome. Uh, she was on the island for almost three years. In 2016, she became a PADI course director and used her newfound superpowers to start up many programs based around cleaning up marine trash, both above and below the water. Now, she has implemented the first routine marine litter monitoring program in Bonaire as 
a World Wildlife Fund ambassador and is currently on assignment for the United Nations Caribbean Environment Program to write the action plan for harmonized marine litter monitoring for the wider Caribbean region. Whew. Okay, got past that one. Okay, we're good now. And uh, so, if you guys would help me, let's give a big round of applause to the Trash Terminator herself, <laughs> Carolyn Caparuso. We have to bring this down. Down, 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 down. There we go. Much better. Thank you. And thank you for that introduction. And thank you all for, for turning out today. I know that my topic is is not really as cool and as exciting as like turtles and I've got some competition. Um, so it's not as exciting as some of the marine critters that, that we get to uh, hear about from other experts, but it's very important to talk about marine litter because it's a human made pressure on our environment and it's something that we have in our hands to do something about. So thank you so much for turning up. And thank you to Emily and Lynn and JJ and the whole tent team of putting everything together here at Sea and Learn, as well as to Brigadoon for hosting us. So without further ado, we're going to talk about solving the mystery of marine litter. All of the pictures that you see in my presentation are taken on the east coast of Bonaire. And that's all plastic that has uh, and other marine litter that has washed ashore. It's not stuff that's just been dumped there. I want to make that really clear. Um, so as JJ said, my name is Carolyn Caparuso. I'm the coordinator of Clean Coast Bonaire, which is a marine litter monitoring program in Bonaire. Um, the picture there was a great big um, coalition cleanup that we had on the East Coast. Uh, tons and tons of plastic washing ashore there. And it's something um, that we all really need to do something about. So I'm going to take you through a few really important questions about marine litter. First of all, what is it? Why is it a problem? What are its sources and what can we do to understand and prevent it? Uh, it's really a lot more complicated than you think. Um, whenever I start talking about marine litter, I really turn into this meme like, okay, there's this and there's that and there's that and if we do this and so I get a little all over the place, but, but we really do have to look at all the different aspects of the problem if we're going to solve it. It's, it's not one science, but uh, a lot of different programs are coming together. So now when you talk about marine litter, you really have to take a multidisciplinary approach to it. So oceanographers are involved looking at the currents that are carrying the marine litter around. Biologists are taking a look at how plastics and other marine litter are impacting all of the wonderful wildlife that, that we love so much. Uh, chemistry is involved looking at what the plastics are made of, what chemicals they're interacting with. Uh, sociology, looking at behavioral patterns that contribute to litter and our consumption patterns uh, also involved in solving the problem. Statistics, how do we calculate how much plastics we have in the ocean based on what we're finding on shore. Policy and law is also a very key part of it because we need to have solid legislation in place in order to assist people to make the right decision about marine litter and plastic usage. Design, we need better products. Right now, we're just using all these products that we can use once and throw away. We need to take a good look at, at how we can solve the issue, and so there's a lot of designers looking at it. So, and there's many, many more fields involved. This is just a start. So the question, what is marine litter? It's any solid material that's manufactured or processed. So we're not talking about wastewater. We're just talking about any solids that are out there. They can be deliberately discarded or uh, unintentionally lost. We find it on beaches, on shores, or floating around at sea. Uh, it gets into the marine environment primarily from land, by rivers, sewage systems, winds, uh, from boats or ships. And what we're finding right now is that 90% of marine litter is plastic. So I have a tendency when I'm talking that when I say marine litter, I'll kind of switch out and just call marine plastic because that's really the, the main problem. That's the crux of it. Uh, we also do sometimes find metal, wood, rubber, glass, and paper and cardboard. Uh, there was a recent uh, report that was put together by the World Bank called Marine Pollution in the Caribbean, Not a Minute to Waste. And it's a really, really good read because what they did is they really highlighted why we need to pay attention to marine litter in such a way that economists can understand. Because a lot of times human beings don't start solving a problem until they realize how it's hitting their pocketbooks. 
And uh, the study really shows that, so even if you don't care about the marine life that's being impact, impacted by marine litter, over 100 million people in our region are provided with food, income, and livelihoods by marine ecosystems through tourism, through fisheries, also the coastal protection that it gives us, as well as transportation. 57 billion is the estimated gross revenue in our region from marine and coastal tourism. That's from 2017, so back when we actually had normal tourist numbers, and that's only the insular Caribbean that we're talking about. So we're not talking about the US or, or South America, but just the islands. Um, so that's a lot of cheddar. I mean, that's, that should already get people's attention. That's, that's a whole lot of money. The ocean also brings in billions of dollars through uh, fisheries and ocean-going transportation. So that's the blue economy. So you hear people talk about that, but really it, it is quite a lot of money involved as well. So, so how it affects tourism? Uh, well, it damages the aesthetics of our product. Nobody wants to go to a place that has a dirty beach. And it's also quite expensive to clean it up to keep everything looking nice if you always have to have teams out there collecting the plastic that's washing ashore. So this picture up here is from Boca Onima and Bonaire. This is one of my marine litter monitoring sites before a cleanup. So you got lots of plastic bottles, some fisheries related uh, litter over there. And afterwards, we have my whole happy team of socially distant volunteers after they've cleaned up that beach. Um, they're probably also happy because I, I make homemade cookies and give them beer for turning up and cleaning <laughs> litter with me. So uh, they're a really great team. So shout out to any of them who are watching from home. Um, so in addition to that, we've got, I think I can probably go through this pretty quickly. People have all seen the photos of what happens when marine life interact with marine litter. Over 200 different species are impacted. All of our favorite critters like whales and dolphins and turtles and uh, sea otters, your favorite. <laughs> um, <laughs> birds and fish, uh, they can get tangled up in all different horrific ways. Um, they can also ingest plastic. Uh, at the other night's presentation, Lara even talked about how tropic birds are even now being found to have plastics in their stomachs. Uh, but they're, they're also, it's mistaken for, for food. They eat it, the birds find it, they feed it to their babies, the turtles eat it, straws get stuck up their nose, like that horrible video that I think everybody has seen. And uh, even uh, in the smaller fish, so you've got a, a yellowtail snapper that was caught and cut open, and you can see all the plastic that they found in its stomach. And what it does is it causes the animals to slowly starve to death because their stomachs are full of plastic, they can no longer digest food, and they die. Um, new studies are showing that uh, plastic is also a really good life raft for invasive species. So if you think about a plastic bottle floating on the surface of the water, it's going to move quite quickly because it's lightweight, the wind pushes it, and so anything that has encrusting on it is going to find a new home in an entirely different area. So there's more research occurring right now. We don't even fully understand the extent of this problem, but I think it is something that we should be very concerned about, particularly when we're looking at things like um, stony coral tissue loss disease. So um, that's a picture I have on the bottom because it can cause severe ecosystem disruptions, how moving everything's moving around very quickly on the plastic. Now the fisheries industry contributes to marine litter but it also is greatly impacted by marine litter. And so it should, they should be very, very concerned about it, anybody who works in the industry, because it causes lost or damaged fishing gear. So having things out there in the ocean, your lines catch on it, your nets catch on it. Um, you can have restricted catch. Uh, also, it's more and more of concern that fish and shellfish can be contaminated by microplastics. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And vessel damage, I mean, who wants to prop <laughs> a line like that. So really needs to be addressed by the industry. This, these pictures, again, all taken on Bonaire. Um, so something that's really the most worrying thing about plastic, not just that it lasts so long in our environment, but once it's out in our environment, it breaks down. It's exposed to UV radiation, it's exposed to salt, waves are moving it around as it washes ashore. The plastic gets more and more brittle and it starts to break into teeny tiny pieces. And you'll notice that if you're doing a cleanup, you pick up a bottle and it just crumbles in your hand. Same thing with uh, polystyrene, so styrofoam, the coarse styrofoam. You, you try to pick it up and it's just in these little teeny tiny pieces that um, get smaller and smaller and smaller. So we find quite a lot of that. I'll cover that in a second. But the reason why it's a, of such concern is it is the new food chain. Um, so microplastics 
the microplastics that are, are being formed from larger pieces of plastic breaking down into smaller pieces of plastic, that's secondary microplastics. Uh, there's primary microplastics, which are ones that are made by design, like you've heard about in um, uh, facial scrubs or different kind of soaps, anything that's like got an abrasive quality to it, a lot of times that has microplastic in it, but there's new legislation in place to try to reduce that, but every other piece of plastic out in the ocean is forming these teeny tiny pieces, and what we know about the ecosystem and the web of life is that, you know, we've got these little teeny tiny things floating around, they look like plankton, the small fish eat that, the bigger fish eat the smaller fish, it's now bioaccumulating, now people are eating the bigger fish, and Microplastics are known, they're, they're made from chemicals that are known to be carcinogenic and also to be endocrine disruptors. So these plastics that are out there that are in our food chain, they they're known to cause developmental, reproductive, neurological, and immune disorders, both in wildlife and in humans. Studies are now even finding plastics in coral because corals are filter feeders. So they're eating these teeny tiny pieces and we still don't actually understand yet the full impact of what this even means. But there's a new kind of science coming up about microplastics. So they're looking at, at different samples and now cataloging the different types of, of microplastics that are being found. So based on what, what they come from, you've got different little pieces. Oh, I'm gonna use my pointer. Uh, so you've got fragments that are broken down, pellets that are usually what were manufactured. Um, something else that's really concerning are, are the sheets and films. So every piece of like plastic wrap, saran wrap, food wrap, anything that goes out there that's really easy for it to break into teeny tiny pieces that we don't even see. Filaments coming from ropes and fibers. All of our polyester clothing, particularly from the fast, fast fashion industry, every time you wash it, you're breaking off these little teeny tiny plastic microfibers. To make it even worse, when plastics are out there floating around in the ocean, plastics are basically acting like sponges. Any contaminants, so any chemical releases, anything that they float through, they absorb. So now even add that to what I was just saying about the uh, bioaccumulation of fish eating bigger you know bigger fish eating the smaller fish so now we've got even more of a concentration not just of the plastics but any of the harmful chemicals that they may have floated through there is a lot of concern about this but they're only now starting to understand the full extent of of what sort of impact this has on human health Another uh, thing about marine litter that is not so much of a concern here on Saba because people don't live as close to the coast, but in other places you have all of this plastic washing ashore and then you have a good rain then you've got fresh water accumulating in the bottles and now you've got mosquito breeding ground that can be a vector for um, mosquito-borne diseases. But I have to admit, plastic isn't all bad. I mean, it. It was a pretty cool invention <laughs> at the time. I mean, they, th there were pretty significant advances that were made in our society and our world after the invention of plastic. I mean, help get women out of the kitchen. Come on, look at her cleaning all those dishes. <laughs> and now, you know, if you can have plastic plates and forks and you can throw it away when you're done, isn't that wonderful? And things like diapers and, and, and whatnot, it's, it, it also helps us preserve our food better. And living on an island, I mean, somebody asked me to go completely plastic free and I said, well, no, I have to eat. I mean, it, you, if you can't buy food that isn't wrapped in plastic, what are you gonna do? Um, and plastic has become so invisible in our lives because it's everywhere. We don't notice it and we can't avoid it. I mean, can you think about the last single use plastic item that you interacted with today? I bet all of you have interacted with many. I'll start. I had yogurt out of a little plastic cup. Couldn't really avoid it. I couldn't buy a bigger thing. Couldn't make my own yogurt here. But can anybody else name a single-use plastic item that they interact with? Yeah. Plastic water bottle. Cling film. Yeah. How about you? Plastic cup. Plastic cup. Yeah. But if we think about it, there are great reusable alternatives to all of those things. So your plastic cup, you could use a regular cup and wash it again, right? That's not so hard. 
cling film, there's really cool stuff like beeswax wraps or different like silicon stretchy things that you can use to put over food. Plastic water bottles, of course we can reuse water bottles. I mean, there are alternatives out there. We just have to stop and recognize the plastics in our lives. And so many people have this like plastic epiphany that they find themselves and be like, Carolyn, I was in my bathroom and I was like, there's so much plastic in here. So I urge you to go home at the end of the day and take a look and just pick like one or two things that you could possibly replace in your, in your life. I mean, the internet is full of really cool information about swap outs that make a huge difference. But I think it's important to take a look at the plastic industry. So it wasn't until the 1950s that plastic production really began. Um, but take a look at this. By 2015, so we went from zero tons of plastic being produced in 1950 to 350 million tons per year being produced. It is just an insane amount of plastic. And where is it all going? It is estimated that 8 million tons of plastics leak into the ocean as pollution every year. That's the equivalent of a dump truck being dumped into the ocean every minute. And they also calculate that there's over 150 million tons of plastic already in the ocean. Studies are showing that most plastic is, I know, isn't it? And from a previous see and learn, we know that this seahorse is a female because of its stomach. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we've got our nice little poster child of single use plastic. The seahorse has found a plastic Q-tip to swim around with. Um, so 80% of marine plastic comes from land-based sources, gets into the environment in different ways, mostly from storm runoff, sewer overflows, beach visitors who uh, leave their litter behind, Inadequate waste disposal, I mean, that's, that's not something that is as much of an issue here, but in third world countries where there isn't enough financing out there to have regular waste collection or to have proper waste disposal, you're gonna be having a lot more weight litter escaping into the environment. Um, industrial activities and construction and illegal dumping also contribute. So we see this lovely seahorse running around with a Plastic Q-tip, how do you think it got into the ocean? What's your theory as to how that seahorse found that Q-tip? Toilet. Sorry? The toilet, so sewer, sewer river to the ocean. That is correct. Oh, really? You know what you're talking about, <laughs> yes. I was hoping we'd get some other guesses of people on the boats cleaning their ears and stuff, but yeah. Um, can you believe that? I mean, I think like living here, you would never think of flushing a, a, a Q-tip down the toilet. But yeah, people do. They figured out that, um, that yeah, there's really a, quite a lot of, of these cotton bud sticks being found on the beaches uh, uh, in different areas. And they realize people flush them. It passes through the, the sewage system. The grates aren't um, fine enough to catch them. And they uh, escape into the ocean. And so now that they've addressed that, they're able to combat it. So with knowledge, we have power. So they're addressing it with an awareness campaign. Hey, guys, don't flush your Q-tips. Um, they're included on a single-use plastic ban in Europe and uh, people, it's pretty easy swap out. This I think is one of the most simple single-use single plastic items to, to change out. If, you're, if you must, if you're one of those addicts that needs a Q-tip, uh, you can switch it out for uh, the old-fashioned paper ones that we used to have. So it should be pretty easy. But if you are out on a beach doing a cleanup and you find a little white plastic stick and you're like, hmm. Is this a lollipop stick? Is this a straw? What is this? If you want to know if it's a Q-tip, all you have to do is take a look at both ends. And there's these little grooves on either end because the, the cottony bits don't survive being in the ocean for very long. But if you take a look and you find that, that's where, what keeps the cotton on it. So now you know how to identify a Q-tip when you're on a beach cleanup. Okay, so that's really the all of the problems to make you understand why dealing with marine litter is so important. So now we're gonna move into my line of work. Uh, that is collecting data along with debris. How many people here have participated in a beach cleanup? You guys rock! Oh, that's fantastic, fantastic. Rivers count too, yes, because they are a good source. That is wonderful. 
Um, how many people have participated in International Coastal Cleanup Day? Yep, great, fantastic. So International Coastal Cleanup Day is a really cool citizen science program where people not only clean a beach, so we're solving the very first problem, we're removing the litter from the marine environment. Next step, collecting data. So International Coastal Cleanup has a form that you fill in. There's about 40 different litter categories. The data gets submitted to a global database. There's quite a lot that can be done with that data. We know now what we're finding and what the percentages are of the items that we're cataloging, which is cool. However, if you do that year after year, let's say maybe you clean a beach and you have 100 volunteers. So you collect a whole lot of litter and you have a whole lot of data. But the next year, you didn't advertise so much and you only had 20 volunteers. So you're probably not gonna collect as much litter during that beach cleanup. So, so in that sense, because this program is so easy and accessible, the data, you can't do quite as much with it. We're not able to see trends over time because if we said, oh yeah, at that beach cleanup, we collected this much litter, and on this beach cleanup, when we have a lot less volunteers, we collected less, somebody could look at it and say, oh, we have less litter, which is not correct, right? So we need to have some sort of a program that is actually scientifically developed to put marine litter data into the hands of policymakers in such a way that they can use it with the ultimate goal of enabling the development of suitable litter reductions, both locally, regionally, and globally. So this comes into the program that I work on. It took a little while to get there, but I promise it's worth it. Um, so the uh, OSPAR convention, which is a hybrid of the words Oslo and Paris, which is where the convention was signed, um, is an international cooperation on environmental protection of the Northeast Atlantic. And so that is all the uh, different countries in Europe that share the sea that got together and decided they wanted to work on different protection measures. So they developed a uniform marine litter monitoring program uh, in combination with scientists and policymakers so that they can all collect data in the same way and start working on solutions. The data that they collected was used to implement the single use plastic ban in Europe. So basically knowledge is power. They figured out what the most prevalent items and most problematic items are, are and they used it to do something about it. And one of the things they, they found was that 50% of what they find on their beaches are single use plastics, which is what led to the ban. 34% um, come from other plastics and 16 from non-plastics. So this is how they strategically targeted the problematic items. So of course, one of the countries that does it is our friend the Netherlands right over here. They do marine litter monitoring on four different beaches. So um, the program is slightly different than International Coastal Cleanup in that we collect a little bit more data with it. It's not that much more complicated. The, um, we collect a little bit more information about the site, how close it is to litter sources. We collect a little bit more uh, data about the marine litter items. So ICC has about 40, and this project has over 100. Um, and what we do during the surveys is we do it four times a year. So every three months, we have the exact same survey site, and we clear all of the litter there and count it. So in doing so, we're not just getting the standing crop, meaning just the items and the percentages, we are actually able to determine the flux accumulation. So by clearing everything in the exact same area, we can now see the trends over time, how much is washing ashore in a fixed time. But in essence, it's the same thing. You're doing a beach cleanup, you're just counting everything, and a lot of the items are all the same. So it, it's not that difficult, it's just that it has to happen four times a year at the same site. And like I said, in using that data, we can now take a look at trends. We can actually show the policymakers not only what we need to target, what's getting worse, but we can show what's getting better. We can show how do we, you know, we can keep on implementing all of these reduction measures, but unless we're monitoring to see if they're actually working, then why are we doing them? So we need, it is essential to have this kind of data collection in place to make positive change. Um, and by having that slightly longer list of litter items, we can do a lot more with the data. We can actually take a look not only at the composition, so is it plastic, is it metal, is it glass, 
but we can also look at the source activities and the source industries that are generating this plastic. Oh, I was trying to use the, oh, right. So recreational items, smoking, balloons, toys, eating and drinking, this is kind of where all of our uh, single use items are coming in. Um, hygiene and medical actually does contribute quite a bit. All of our cosmetics bottles, um, razors, toothbrushes, and this one, which is a new item of concern that's just recently uh, started, we started looking at, as well as, so these are kind of our more land-based sources. And then down below, we've got our fishing and our shipping industries that we're looking at as well. Within the OSPAR region, they've also developed a few other um, indicators that they're looking at. So they have a few more monitoring programs. They're looking at microplastics. They're looking at rivers, like, like where you uh, worked on. They're also looking at the stomach contents of fulmars. Uh, fulmars are kind of like a, they look like a big uh, seagull, and they're quite a common bird in the Northeast Atlantic. So that's the stomach contents of one. So every time uh, they find a dead fulmar in the Northeast Atlantic, they take it for a necroscopy, and they look at all the plastics in their stomachs. And they're also moving into uh, sea turtles as well as another indicator to determine. This is also what we're looking at is what harm is being done to the marine environment by this plastic. But there's positive. Okay, so, uh, so it's not all gloom and doom. This is something that's pretty cool. So they were finding quite a lot of plastic bottle caps on the beaches. And they took a look at it and realized that, wow, if we just make a design change and make sure that the cap stays attached to the bottle, and people are turning the bottle in to be recycled, the cap stays on and we're gonna have less leakage out into the environment. So they use that to, to change policy and make a design change. So by, by mandate, by, 20, oops, by 2024, all caps and lids need to be attached to bottles that are under three liters. And they estimate that this is gonna result in about 10% less plastics being found on the beaches. So woohoo data, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's cool that they're, they're actually able to use this. But my colleague told me a story that I think is pretty interesting. That they first time they had a meeting with a large manufacturer of beverage, plastic beverage bottles and explained to them, hey, we're finding a lot of caps on the beaches. The first reaction was, oh no, that's so terrible. What can we do about it? But by the second meeting, they had lawyered up and they had scientisted up and they came in and they said, well, how exactly did you collect your data? And they wanted to rip holes in it. So it's, again, it's another reason why we have to have kind of a bulletproof uh, methodology that we're using that we can say, yes, this was scientifically developed, we're following a protocol, and now we can really prove to you that these are your items. Because that's the only way these manufacturers are gonna start making change. Not only if there's consumer demand, but if there is a legal mandate for them to do so. Dolly rope is another big exa good example of what's going on um, with the fishing industry. So we find a lot of these weird little blue and orange plastic ropes on our beaches, and they find a lot of it in Europe as well. It is dolly rope. Dolly rope is basically like a little fringy cushion at the bottom of a fishing net that's used that's dragged across the seafloor. Now fishing nets are really expensive, so if your fishing net catches on the substrate, it catches on the bottom, you could lose your, or tear your net. So basically they buy the cheapest possible plastic rope, they make a bunch of fringe that they stick on the bottom like that, and so when they drag it across the floor of the, of the sea, it breaks off. That's what it's designed to do. So over 50% of these dolly ropes are lost into the sea. They're designed to be lost. So in the EU, they're working to um, have it qualify as a single-use plastic, because it's designed for one-time use, basically. But they're also looking after go looking into going after the industry with extended producer responsibility. Because if you can prove where this plastic is coming from and why, you can also start recouping costs for the cleanup. So I think this is a really, really interesting thing to, to keep an eye on. And the, again, this picture taken in Bonaire. That's all plastic dolly rope that washes ashore. So now we're gonna jump over from Aspar to the Caribbean. So within the Caribbean, we have a Convention for Protection and Development of the Marine Environment. That's the Cartagena Convention. Uh, it's a regional agreement to protect the Caribbean Sea. And basically it has three different protocols, oil spills, specially protected areas, and land-based sources of marine pollution. 
as I mentioned, 80% of our marine litter is determined to be from land-based sources. So this is extremely important to working together regionally to solve the problem of marine litter. It was uh, entered into force in 2010. Uh, and if you could see on the map, I find it very interesting that there's one a country that is not to date ratified the land-based sources protocol, and that's the Netherlands. So the major conversation that's occurring within our region does not include the BES islands, essentially. Which isn't to say that, that the wider Caribbean region isn't taking steps to, to reduce marine litter. There are a lot of programs that are, are coming into place. You can find a lot of great information online about what islands have implemented uh, plastic bag bans and single-use plastic bans. So there is some work being done, but it's all kind of on an individual level. It's not harmonized. It's not really pulled together quite yet. And it's very important to be keeping an eye on items of concern within our region because we've got our beautiful model, the seahorse again, this time uh, I think a boy seahorse, um, carrying around one of our new items of concern in the marine environment, uh, uh, those masks, those single-use masks, they're made from plastic fibers. They're basically plastic. They're a single-use plastic item. Um, as well as wipes, gloves, and other things. So it's again, it's important to keep the conversation within the region because it's not it's an evolving field with more items of concern being added. Um, so I mentioned uh, oceanography coming into play. If you take a look at the map over there and you look at the currents, you've got the um, North Atlantic current basically looping around, and then you've got the Southern Atlantic one looping around again, and here they join and they form the Caribbean current. So what's happening is in our region and in our world, it's my plastic, your problem, your plastic, my problem. Plastic litter knows no boundaries. It floats around from absolutely anywhere. And that's why it's absolutely essential. So even if we could be doing the most perfect job ever here on SABA, stopping any single use plastic, making sure none of it leaks into the environment, if people who are up current from us aren't doing that, you still have the exact same problem going. So we need to have local, regional, and global strategy to stop this. So that brings me to marine litter monitoring in the Caribbean and the project that I'm working on. The WWF said, okay, let's take a look at the marine litter monitoring that's occurring in the Netherlands. And why don't we try piloting it in Bonaire and see how it works? So that was three years ago, and my team and I have now collected over 100,000 pieces of marine litter. So we've got a pretty good data set to look at. Um, and the reason why, uh, so what we did is we started using the OSPAR protocol so that we could speak the exact same language to the Netherlands, right? So we can use the same protocol that they're using, so all the data that we collect, they will understand completely. What we've been finding, sadly, is uh, a heck of a lot of plastic. Um, we have two sites on our eastern coastline, so our windward side, Boca Onima and Piedra Preto. Uh, those, are, those two sites are the ones where we really collect the most uh, small pieces of plastic, smaller than 2.5 centimeters. At Teamo Beach, which is, uh, how many people here have been to Bonaire? Okay, so you kind of know your way around. Um, so Teamo Beach is uh, right across from the airport. And it's a very popular recreationally used beach. It's also a sea turtle nesting ground. And it's pretty tragic that uh, my, my team of citizen scientists and I last month collected over 4,000 cigarette butts on that beach. And bearing in mind that in the Aspar region, they, they survey 100 meters. We reduced it to 50 meters just to make it manageable because on average, we find about 1,500 pieces of marine litter in a 50 meter stretch. And in the Netherlands, on an average 100, meters, 100 meter survey, they usually collect about 400 items. So we've already got that kind of statistic to show like, yes, we have a lot more plastic pollution. On an average survey in Bonaire, we collect about 1,500 items of litter in 50 meters. And in the Netherlands, on a 100 meter stretch, they collect 400 on average. Yeah. 
So it, it's pretty gruesome, really, the, the statistics. So we've collected um, cigarette butts. Oh, sorry. Cigarette butts are really the most uh, commonly found item in the world. But we've collected over 200, mostly at Tayamo. And then again, unidentifiable plastic pieces, plastic caps, metal bottle caps. Those are mostly on Tayamo because people hang out there drinking beer. Um, gla broken glass from the beer bottles, uh, plastic bottles, and then your single use uh, items for eating and drinking. Um, just to, to give an idea of how much of it is plastics at uh, Tayamo Beach, it's about 75% plastic. That's including cigarette butts. And then you've got your metal bottle caps and glass. Um, Boca Onima and Piedro Preto, both over 90% plastic. Another way that we collect uh, marine litter data is diving, because of course, the floaty stuff washes ashore, the sinky stuff <laughs> we have to collect while on scuba. So um, I have used to organize quite large cleanup dives under the two main piers of Bonaire, and primarily what we find there is fishing line, because um, a lot of people like to recreational fish, recreationally fish there. What happens is they catch a fish, a fish will swim around all the pilings under the pier and then get all tangled up. They'll cut the line, leave it, so now it's abandoned, lost, or discarded fishing gear. And what you've got is a perfect spider web to catch turtles. So in order to keep turtles from, from dying underneath the piers, now the Sea Turtle Conservation Bonaire hosts uh, cleanup dives where people would just go and uh, pick up fishing line. Um, but all of that data can get reported in a really cool citizen science program that's developed by Patty Project Aware called Dive Against Debris. And uh, again, it's, it's similar to ICC, only the list has about 100 litter items of uh, the ones that are mostly found underwater. Ooh, wait, just to go back. And we are hosting a Dive Against Debris tomorrow at 1 p.m. You can sign up with Emily. We'll be diving around the moorings and uh, picking up as much marine litter as we can find. Hopefully we won't find that much. Even if we don't find any, it's a, we'll still submit the data because we've, we've done a survey then and we can show how clean Seba is. So, but please, uh, please join me. It'll be a lot of fun. And nice yeah, it's a cool dive too. So when we're not looking for marine litter, we can look for cool critters. Uh, so here on Seba, uh, over the past, in the past year, uh, OSPAR marine litter monitoring has become occurring uh, at Cove Bay. Um, that program was uh, organized by Seba Conservation Foundation and the Dutch Caribbean Nature Alliance. I think Dahlia left. Oh. <laughs> um, so what they've been finding there is there's been four surveys uh, and over 3,000 items ha have been collected. So you guys are doing quite a bit better than we are on Bonaire. Yeah? Um, because it's recreationally used and also it's easily accessible for the cleanups. I think it was kind of a combination of the two. Yeah, I think it has a mix of things that are washing ashore from from the ocean as well as items that are, are being left behind by users. So it's a good indicator of actually both. And the, that's what the data is also showing. Good catch. Um, so what uh, we're finding there is about 73% plastic. Um, I ran it through what the European Union uh, defines as single-use plastic, and 47% of what's washing ashore there is, meets the definition of single-use. And that includes things like cutlery, straws, stirs, cups, balloons, cigarette butts are included in that list because those are made of plastic, as well as our friend caps and lids. Uh, I just put a few of the main uglies here. So like I said, cigarette butts are the most prevalent, pieces of glass, uh, miscellaneous plastic, metal bottle caps. Um, other ones I thought were kind of interesting were down here, balloons. Those are another big item of concern, uh, plastic bottles. So we have a lot of the eating and drinking as well as uh, some fishing line, string and cord. So these, I think, are more of the items that are washing ashore coming out of the fishing industry. So what, what can we do with this data? 
Um, so we've got this going on in Bonaire. We've got it going on in Seba. I had a really nice conversation the other day with people in Stacia about setting it up there as well. And I've also been taking part in the conversation with the Cartagena Convention. So they convened a group of marine litter experts to talk about how we can really get on the same page to harmonize marine litter monitoring and collect data in the same way. So for that, I was, um, I presented to them about what we're doing in Bonaire, what's occurring in the Aspar region. And so I was hired to do an analysis of what is occurring in our region right now. And what I found is basically ICC is our main source of data. So it's something that is fantastic for awareness raising, but not so much for really hitting the policymakers to really, really show them exactly what's going on in our region. So the recommendations that I made were that we start to use OSPAR marine litter monitoring on more sites in the Caribbean, expand it out to as many islands as we can, but do it in hybrid with ICC that should continue because it's a great source of data as well as in combination with dive against debris so that we can also collect data from underwater and um, so and now I am working on putting together the action plan so it's it's again it's not a super exciting thing to present about but I'm really talking to a lot of people on different islands to try and get everybody on the same page because if not if we're collecting data in different ways we're comparing apples and oranges so we really need to, to get together and start with the most cost effective, simple, low tech way of collecting data, which is beach litter monitoring by doing beach litter uh, cleanups and collecting data. And then we can move on from there. Then once we have our network together, we can work on looking at microplastics and what's going on in our marine life and we can build it from there. But we really, really need to start having the conversation because I hope that I've really demonstrated to you that it is a regional and global problem and we need to work together to solve it. So what can we do personally? Really quickly, I'm sure everybody has heard about the reduce, reuse, recycle, but we also have repurpose, repair, resale. There are so many different things in our lives that we can really look at to reduce plastic. And I really, really urge you to, to just think outside the box, not just saying no to a straw, but, but repairing things and sharing things even. I mean, there's so many really valuable ways that we can, we can reduce plastic in our lives. I also urge you to volunteer for citizen science projects to help us to collect the data that we need to have to enact positive change. For example, my cleanup dive tomorrow at one o'clock. Please sign up with Emily. Um, also, use your consumer power wisely. Shop smart. You know, when you find yourself in the grocery store and you go, why can't I buy this without plastic? Write a letter to the manufacturer. Talk to the people in the store and say, hey, I see that there are other products out there. Why don't you carry them? We, we have a lot of power with, our, with the way we spend our money. Um, and I, I really like this graphic because we don't all have to go zero waste. Going zero waste is really difficult. And I mean, plastic is is a useful item. I'm not saying go home and throw away all the plastic in your house and replace it all with bamboo. That would be silly and you're just wasting that plastic. But buy good quality things and use them for a long time and try to keep them, just you know, get out of that disposable mindset and, and then we can all get there. Um, <laughs> community power. I think also within the community, we need to support each other on our lowering plastic journey. So I was looking through, in anticipation of our visit to Save, I was looking through some of our uh, pictures from when we lived here. Isn't Alex pretty? Look at him. He's so sparkly. But you know what he's sparkly with? Microplastics. Glitter. Yep. Glitter's microplastics. Um, and uh, over here, yeah, Chippy had that like nice giveaway, those sticks that you bang. You have to make noise like I just did. So why, why do we have those? Why are those important? Did, did we have, I think we look like we're having fun, but would we have had less fun if we didn't have all this plastic involved in the event? Uh, people all over the Caribbean are having this exact same conversation. How can you make festivals, events, and carnival just as much fun and just as pretty, but with less plastic? And it is a really important conversation for us to be having. Um, as well as any parties. I mean, I mentioned that we found balloons, the balloons were found at Cove Bay. It's pretty easy swap out for balloons for, for decorations. I mean, for parties, there's other places in the world that will have like a decorations box. That it's a party box, 
Would you have less fun at your party if you had balloons or if you had reusable decorations? No? Yeah. So if you can still decorate with things that are reusable. So I think the concept of having a reusable party box is really, really cool, can help um, reduce plastics. But again, it's something that the community has to support. We have to make that part of our values in order to lead to reduction as well as national actions. So I, I really urge everybody to look into ways to lobby for regional measures to address marine litter. Politically, I think it's extremely important. Also for us, the BES islands, to, to get the Netherlands to ratify the land-based sources protocol so that we can be a part of the conversation, as well as um, request that the Netherlands also support marine litter monitoring here. They actually pay for the monitoring that's occurring in the Netherlands, in the European Netherlands, but here, the work that I'm doing is supported by the WWF, and the monitoring that's occurring here on SABA is being supported by the Dutch Caribbean Nature Alliance and the SABA Conservation Foundation. So I think, again, it's important that we get the same treatment here um, as, as they do in the Netherlands. Do we know why the Netherlands didn't sign the Albert Carlisle Protocol? I don't have all of that information, but I think it's an interesting conversation to have. Um, so as I mentioned, oh, yes, and globally, uh, what a lot of organizations are working on is having a global agreement for marine litter, similar to what you've heard about the Paris Agreement. So that all the countries get together and start working towards plastic reduction because plastic litter knows no boundaries. We need to work on it together. So I urge you to visit uh, www.panda.org to sign a petition calling on the governments of the world to sign a global treaty for marine plastic pollution. So as I mentioned earlier, recycling is also a big part of the conversation for plastic reduction. And so on the island of Bonaire, the WWF funded a small project for uh, plastic recycling. It's called Novo, which means new in uh, Papimento. And I'm gonna turn the mic over to Alex and he's gonna just tell you a little bit about Thank you, Carolyn, for that. Um, she'll be answering questions all night after the presentation, no problem. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, Novo Recycling that we uh, started with help from the WWF uh, on Bonaire. Um, we started by looking at what uh, was already there. Uh, some of you might have heard about precious plastic. Um, it's a small scale, low level, uh, like household size recycling uh, machines. Um, they were designed by a Dutch uh, student in the Netherlands and he did everything open source. So everything is available. You can find the plans, you can buy parts. Uh, everybody's contributing, so they're changing things and it's, it's a great community uh, thing. In 2016, we got some of those machines um, for uh, Bonaire, um, left to right we have a uh, oh, um, we have a shredder just to cut up the bottles to small usable pieces. We have an extruder that uh, when you uh, when you turn it on and you feed the small pieces there, you get like a spaghetti coming out, so we can make bowls or lampshades uh, with that. We have the item that I use the most is our uh, our, our press. Uh, you just heat up a certain amount of plastic and then you make, you press that into the molds uh, and then you get your items. We also have an oven that you just use to melt the plastic and then you can either mold it before or, or during, or, sorry, after or during uh, that. Um, since our oven, uh, for, for using our oven, we need something afterwards to press it. So I build a little uh, hydraulic press. This is just a small car jack and a bunch of YouTube videos and then a <laughs> couple of hours. <laughs> yeah. But it works, it works really well. Uh, I don't do this alone, this is our team and it also shows you what we're, uh, we're using. It's mostly uh, bottles, plastic bottles, all HDPE, uh, which is a very safe plastic to work with, a nice one to start with. Um, you can see some of the bowls we have there, you see the coasters, uh, we had some uh, bottle openers, but. There's a little more on that. The way we collect it is we got our uh, local uh, waste management company to give us two big 
Clicos at the Recycle Center. Um, we've got nice big posters printed about what we want plastic wise and what we speci specifically don't want. And um, yeah, we, the people on, uh, on Monero, they fill them up for us. Uh, and then the hard work starts. Then we need to clean it. Make sure that we clean the labels off from the outside. Make sure that all the contents are gone. Of course, we don't want any uh, soaps in there. And then I get to cut it. So this is what I do on the weekend. I, uh, I clean plastic <laughs> and cut it into pieces that I can feed into the shredder. Um, then we, uh, then I get my, uh, my artistic uh, brain going and I start mixing the colors. And we weigh them just to make sure that we can make a similar mix again, if people would like that. Okay. Then we get all these shredded materials and then we start making our products in the mold. What we try to do is make all products that are useful. We're not try we try not to make plastic for plastic's sake. Yeah. So some things we came up with are uh, phone holders that are right in the bottom there. That's so you can put your phone on a nice angle on your table or something so you can watch videos and things like that. We have our coasters. Those are the ones that were on your seats uh, that, you, that you got. Yeah, They are great. We really like them a lot. Uh, people like them as well. Um, they have a na nice raised edge so the condensation stays on there. And uh, if they get dirty, you just put them in a dishwasher and you wash them. Yeah. Um, we have some knobs like for drawers or for um, a coat rack uh, we haven't experimented too much with that yet but we'll, we'll get there uh, item i really like is our uh, bottle opener just simplest bottle opener there is um, but the, the nice thing about that one is that we really make it from only marine uh, plastic and from uh, really recycled materials everything on there is is used um, so that's kind of cool um other item the flower pots that was also uh, on your chairs um, just a nice small flower pot i use mine not really for flowers i just use them to catch stuff you know hold screws all, all kind of things your change things like that what we did with the with the flower pot when we started that we did a collaboration with uh, one of the ngos on the island which is echo uh, they look after uh, the, the parrot welfare and they try to replant trees on the island um, so that the, the, the parrots can feed off those trees instead of going to people's gardens and creating a havoc there. That brings us to another cool product that we just started about half a year ago and that's the donature tag. We are creating little tags from reused plastic and we're helping NGOs uh, raise money. The first one that came aboard was a Reef Renewal Bonaire. They, uh, they grow and propagate and uh, replant reefs, uh, or coral bits on the, on the island. Um, we made the tag. One side is their logo. The other side is our logo and the information. Little information card with what they do. We sell it to them. They sell it to all the people that want to donate or buy a little souvenir and uh, that way we raise money uh, for the uh, coral reef uh, renewal. Um, we, about a couple of months ago we uh, got a new one. We're now making them also for the donkey sanctuary, um, this organization that tries to keep the donkeys off the streets in Monaire, which is an issue. <laughs> yeah, and you, can, you can imagine it's not very safe if they're uh, running around there and we are in the process of creating one for the animal shelter so we're really trying to do something uh with the products that we make to either make them useful or or, or generate money for for other organizations we were uh, very happy and proud and uh happy to to oblige when uh, see and learn asked us if we could make the field project gifts yeah, uh, yeah. these are all handmade by me yeah. uh, and I think they look really cool. Uh, they, they turn out really nice. Um, and they're handing them out at every field project. So if you don't have your complete collection yet, you have one more chance. That's Carolyn's cleanup dive tomorrow afternoon. So sign up with Emily in the back. <laughs> um, 
I believe it's one o'clock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm very happy with that. Um, this is the end of uh, Carolyn's, cap uh, Carolyn's presentation and my little bit at the end. Um, if you have any questions, find us, fire away. Um, Are there any questions for Alex or for me? Yep. Thank you. So we're from Minneapolis, Minnesota, mm -hmm. thanks to the Mississippi. And I did a little research about where our recycling goes. And I found out that all of our plastic, we have great compliance on our recycling among the residents, but all of our plastic is bailed and sold to brokers, international brokers. And it's my understanding now, especially that China's not taking that plastic that it ends up in small African and Asian countries where they sort it by hand, have a lot of open air, you know, um, melting and things without, you know, any environmental or, you know, human protection controls. And the stuff that can't be recycled gets dumped in the ocean. So because of all, all our non-recyclable trash goes to an incinerator, I tell everyone who comes to our nature preserve that we live on, to not recycle plastic to put it in the trash and they freak out on me. So who's right? Am I right? Because <laughs> I would rather see it burned for electricity mm -hmm. and under our environmental controls in the United States than shipped overseas and who knows what happens. That's, 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 that's a, a very interesting, interesting question. question. I don't know if everybody heard, but it's it's really if it, that recycling can be a bit problematic if you're not sure exactly where it's going. So what is the best course of action? Um, that, that is a really tricky one. I, I, I mean, I would say, I mean, if, if I lived in your area, I would probably be lobbying for more transparency about exactly where the plastic is going, because you're right, if it is going to other countries and not being disposed of properly, then there is little value in it. Because the, the whole concept of recycling, we're not going to recycle our way out of this problem. We need to look at other ways of dealing with the plastic problems such as reduce and repair and and everything I was just talking about but yeah I, I mean I, I don't know all of the details and that's a bit outside of my scope so I, I don't I don't really have an answer to that question I'm sorry <laughs> like the plastic in the ocean expert says that we should burn this stuff for electricity rather than hope that it gets recycled properly by some international broker because once it leaves you know Hennepin County, Minnesota, um, they don't care. But, but it, it's, it's an interesting, interesting point, though, that there should be more tracing of where exactly your waste is going. I mean, I think really uh, people have been really scrambling since China stopped taking our recycling. But it, it sh you should be able to find out it, within your municipality where it's going and what's being done with it. So I would say get together and, and find out. They don't care. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> okay. oh, no, not that. Yeah, and just encourage people to to not make the plastic. I mean, we're just proud of ourselves at the end of the week when it's garbage day. We're like, we have so little in our garbage can. We're nerds. I mean, he cuts plastic all out, all weekend. And I'm sitting there working on my action plan. But yes, okay, your question. That, that is also a good question. So why is Cove Bay being cleaned uh, instead of just uh, instead of cleaning also at Spring Bay because there's a lot of plastic washing ashore there? I think that is a wonderful question, and I agree with you. I think that perhaps there could be a second monitoring site so that Cove Bay shows things that are washing ashore and things that are being left behind, and Spring Bay could also be monitored to keep track of what's washing ashore. I like that. Oh, oh fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, it was a big problem with spring bay is getting yeah, this garbage out. So we had a couple of the fishermen come to shore. We didn't take data. No, we didn't come back any data. Yeah, but, but the, the next, next time you organize one, I can supply the forums. And I mean, if you if you can manage it four times a year, then, then you've got yourself another monitoring site with some interesting data. So fantastic. 
Publications about it because straws have been an attention point, I think, for years, whereas cigarette butts are much less uh, in the news. So, is that the reason why straws are found less, or is that the reason? It's too early to, so the question is, are, are we finding less straws because there's more awareness about straws? It, it's still a little too early to start seeing the trends from it, but we are finding at, at our recreational use site, we are now finding more paper straws <laughs> instead of plastic straws. So that's now a write-in on our form. So it's, you know, we're making new kinds of litter. So we, we need to change, change behavior, behavior as well. well. So. So. Okay. I, just, I just wanted to come back to Kofi because what I was wondering, because in Kofi, you of course have that, uh, that wall. Isn't that stopping a lot of litter coming in? Yes. So, so because of, of how the, how Kofi uh, the topography of Cove Bay, yeah. So not all of it is washing ashore. You're getting some, but you're also getting litter that's left behind. So you have two sources. Because if it's floating around in there. Like if you're doing it for research purposes and you want to show what is being washed ashore, you're missing quite a bit of data. Then. Yes, yes, that's, that's, well, that's, that's what, what she brought up. up. Why aren't you cleaning at Spring Bay as well so that you're getting the pure data of what, what's washing ashore? But it, it's a start. It, you know, it's an easily accessible site that can be monitored four times a year. And it is it is turning up interesting data in what litter is being left behind from here, which is also very important to look at what items can be addressed here on SABA in addition to what is is coming out regionally and globally. But but I agree, there, there should be more than one site. But I'm gonna talk to some people about that while I'm here. So thank you for bringing that question up. And Carolyn is gonna be dining here tonight. So uh, we'll save the rest of the questions. You guys can ask her while you are eating tonight. So. guys so thank you very much for coming out to another awesome see and learn event don't forget our final night is tomorrow night so please come out bring your friends tell your people to watch online and uh, other than that we do need to turn this back into a restaurant so if you guys can make your way either outside or to the bar go grab a drink with robin and uh we will have this ready for you guys to eat very soon thank you guys